by people in power, you know, people that could make policies that could help people who are struggling with Huntington's disease as a boutique disease, meaning not enough people have it for people to care about it. So the month of May is a huge push for us to get the word out there to the world that this thing exists, that there are people who are living with it and need help, and that we need to find a cure for this thing. Because every child of a parent that has Huntington's disease has a 50-50 shot of inheriting it. It is a genetic disease in nature and we could end this thing. We could stop it from tearing families apart uh, if we all come together and we work together and we raise money and we raise awareness. So uh, I wanted to uh, say thank you to everybody for being here for this wonderful cause tonight. Um, we have a goal uh, of trying to raise $15,000 tonight. Hopefully we can do it. Um, and for everybody who donates $20 or more, not only will you be here with us for this reunion, you will also be able to join us uh, for a fan exclusive question and answer session where uh, we have collected a bunch of questions from you online and uh, we will be answering your burning questions uh, live and kind of like a, a private uh, Ginny and Georgia convention hall kind of where we all answer mm -hmm. all the questions that you have. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce everybody that we have here with us tonight. We have Sarah Lampert, our show's creator. We have Deborah Fisher, our showrunner. Uh, the two of them work tirelessly day and night to give uh, our characters everything that they say, everything that they do, and allow us actors to just be a part of something very special. We have our two fearless leaders on the acting side, Brianne and Tony. Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> as well as, as the rest of the gang, we have Sarah Weisglass who plays Maxine. We have Raymond L. Black who plays Joe, which I know so many of you out there love. Uh, we have Jennifer <laughs> Robertson who plays Ellen. We have Felix Mallard who plays Marcus, who I know so many of you want to climb through your window. <laughs> and we have Diesel Lazzarocco, who, who of course is the cutest kid on Netflix, uh, which, is, uh, which is a question that I was asked repeatedly. How does it feel to be the cutest kid on Netflix, Diesel? Uh, so everybody out there, uh, <laughs> loves you so much. Okay. So, uh, we are going to forge ahead. Uh, what I think I want to start with is the beginning. How did the show come together in your head, Sarah? What was the impetus behind creating this amazing show? Yes. Um, so many things. I'm, I'm not muted. Am I right? Okay, great. Um, yeah, so many things. I think um, ultimately Georgia is not based on my mom at all, but I have a lot of very strong women in my family. And uh, that mother-daughter connection, I think is the most interesting, one of the most interesting connections that two people can have. Um, I think that Ginny and Georgia at its heart is a mother-daughter story and that that heart is uh, the germ of the idea that born all of this. So that is great. Awesome. Just being funny and smart and weird and all that. So uh, Deb and Sarah, this, this is for you uh, together. Um, as you went through plotting out the season, uh, how did you come to realize that Tony and Austin's uh, and, and, uh, Diesel's characters were going to jump on a motorcycle and take off to nowhere. And that was going to be your big cliffhanger. How did, how did you end up on the end of the season? We, we heard of the season started, but how did it really come to that, uh, that ending, that giant cliffhanger? You want to start? Sure. I mean, I'll start, jump in whenever you want. Um, but basically look, we have three main characters in the show. We have Ginny, we have Georgia, and then the relationship between the two of them. And we start in a place where they're driving into town and they have a fresh start going and there's hope here. It's Georgia's first time putting down real roots. She wants this to work. This has been her end game. This is her idea of being a successful mom. And then at the end of it, we have Ginny leaving town fleeing, you know, in the middle of the night without Georgia thinks she finally got everything she wanted. And in the process of them be, and giving every, well, people have seen the show if they're here. So <laughs> in the process of the, of the season, uh, Ginny has realized a lot of skeletons in her mom's closet that makes her make the decision to everything Georgia did was for Ginny. And then some of the things she did were too much. And Ginny, 
makes the decision to, uh, to leave. And also just to add the great dialogue that Ginny has as she and George are driving through town call back when Ginny says, you know, yeah, flee into the night. That's also like foreshadowing where we go at the end of season one. And I just want to add to when, when Sarah and I were, had met several times and we were planning, you know, a more detailed pitch to Netflix. She and I talked about that last moment a lot. And we really built on that a lot. And I just want to say, we're not writing partners, but we're creatively very joined at the brain. And that was like such a great synergy between the two of us where we were just like really building on like how we wanted to end this season. And it was like so, so much fun. So much fun to pitch the show and so much fun. And to, to jump on that, I know we have so many questions. To jump on that, Deb, too, <laughs> I know that we decided the last thing that we wanted to have happen wasn't necessarily, I know I just said, wasn't necessarily that Ginny runs away, but that Ginny finds out her mom's a murderer. And so then it's like the natural thing that comes after that. But that was how we wanted to end season one. Ginny finds out. Yep. I was going to say, you said her mom does a little too much for her. And I was like, you mean murder someone? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, can we unpack that a little bit more, Sarah? <laughs> so I'm glad you addressed it. I don't know. I, my nose is so sunburned. I feel like I can't even pay attention to anything else. <laughs> so did you know from Jump Street, though, that that by the end of season one, Ginny was going to find out. That's, you knew immediately. That's where we were building towards. Yes. Right. So when you went in and you pitched the show to Netflix, I, I think you said you had a, a certain number of seasons that you were willing to pitch. Uh, are you willing to talk about how many seasons you pitched to Netflix or do we want to keep that under wraps? I don't think it's a secret. I think we've talked about it in interviews that when Sarah and I went in together, we pitched for four seasons of Jenny and Georgia, big, big tent poles for all the characters. So we, you know, things always go in different directions, but we have a very clear idea of where we want to go in four seasons. And that pitch lasted like 45 minutes. Like they were like, great, <laughs> thanks for coming in. We're wrapping up. And Deb and I are like, wait, we haven't gotten to what happens in season four for Austin. And they're like, we're leaving now. Like <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> we've, we've heard enough. You got the show. You got the show. Just... We, you got, okay. okay they called us an hour <laughs> later and picked it up. So that is exactly. That is such a quick turnaround. That's incredible. It seems that they knew that they were going to have a hit on their hands from, from the very beginning. And that's awesome. Um, talking about the beginning for all of the actors, um, you know, for me, I, I got this script on a Thursday uh, for a Friday audition, which very often happens. I was in the middle of doing a musical uh, our lead actress, I was doing the last five years with Janelle Parrish and she had to go away and do a Netflix film. And so she wasn't there for our closing weekend. And I was having to run the show in rehearsal with another actress that morning, went to see you all across town, auditioned and very much like Sarah was like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I was like, wait, did I do everything you guys need? I, I got to go, but I could do it again if you need to. And you're like, no, 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 we're good. We're good. Go ahead. And I left my water bottle, which is a necessity for me when I was doing the show and I walked back down and I heard, I think it was Deb go, that's, so that's the guy, right? That's the guy. And I, I was very hopeful throughout the weekend. And then we closed the show on a Sunday night. I got a call at 3.30 AM in the morning, Monday morning uh, from my agent, because I guess they called at 6.30 AM Eastern time to say that, uh, that I had gotten the, the gig. And then I was up for the table read four days later. That was like the timeline for me. How did everybody else get involved? Let's start with Brianne. How, how, did, how did you know that this was a project you wanted so badly? How, and, and what was the audition process like? I got the script. I was out of town. I was in Europe. It was so sad because we didn't think any of the timing was going to work out, but I read it and just thought, who the hell is this lady and how is she getting away with everything? Um, but I also was like, no one's going to believe I have a 15 year old. Like, I don't know if this is really meant to be. And then I came home from my trip and was told that the role had actually been cast. And then 24 hours later, they said, hold up. Can you do a self tape right now? Sent in a tape. I think it was like a Friday to Monday thing also went in. Then the next day, poor Tony had to fly out for like the 35th time. And I got to meet her. Um, and we had a really fun, incredible chemistry read that was uh, like two two hours, I think. 
So it felt like we were on to something and um, yeah, it was all women in there and Jack, Anya's dog was in there. That felt very special. And yeah, the rest is kind of history. Yeah, Anya was the director of our first two episodes of the season. She's our uh, director and producer uh, on the show. Um, Tony, uh, Brienne just said like the 35th time. How many chemistry reads did you go through? (laughs) Um, <laughs> let's see, uh, I, um, enough to get a blood clot from flying too much, um, which is fun. Oh, sorry, um, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's no one's fault. It's no one's fault. Um, <laughs> you know, you gotta do what you gotta do at the end of the day. Um, I basically, uh, I think I flew out like four times, but it was like within a three week period. So I was on like a flight for five hours, like four different times, or maybe it was like, it was like 30 hours of flying in a span of like three weeks because I read with so many Georgias and, um, that's okay. You know, it's fine. It's the, it's, you know, and then finally though, by the fourth time that they were like, Hey, my manager was like, Hey, they want you back in LA. And I was like, I just unpacked, um, <laughs> I was like, are you joking? It was like, no, they, they're still looking for the right Georgia. I had probably read with like 25 actresses. And I was like, oh my goodness. I thought it was funny. Cause like the, uh, I think it was like July 4th was when I thought they had picked an actress yeah. and we had like an earthquake in the middle of the table, uh, in the middle of the chemistry read. And we were already in a basement and I felt like, I thought, I didn't understand that it was an earthquake at first. I thought I was just feeling woozy. And I was like, oh my God, am I going to yak in front of the show like am I gonna just like throw up on the carpet and like lose this job and then they were like oh no that was definitely an earthquake because the ground felt like soup I was like this doesn't make any sense everyone didn't care they're like oh yeah it's just an earthquake it's like an LA thing earthquakes and I was like cool um get me the hell out of here and then um and then I ended up coming back and Brienne walked in the room and I immediately thought if if they do not cast her like (laughs) like how could we not um she's completely Georgia she has to be the one when we read together it just felt so natural and um she was just so amazing and incredible and I immediately was like I could learn so much from this woman she's such an incredible talented person she's very kind and I feel like we're gonna have so much fun and lo and behold we cast Brianna's Georgia and I um I got the opportunity to work with her and so I'm here learning from you (laughs) <laughs> ah. <laughs> let's hear from Learning the third member of the family socks. let's hear from the third member of the family diesel did you read the whole script or did you just read your scenes and just go uh i got this i'm i'm i'm, I'm just gonna be the cutest kid on netflix this is it that's how it happens um well i um at, at the time when i got it i had like two other scenes and stuff that i had to learn for um other things um so uh we had we had done them so we're like we've already learnt these get them out and then we learnt the Ginny and Georgia script um and me and my mum just at the start when we've read it we kind of had a feeling like yeah um I'm pretty sure this this is for you I I I think we're gonna get this um and then we read um more about the description of the character and how he always wears the Harry Potter glasses and stuff and then my mum actually put a thing on Facebook and she was like um, in urgent need of Harry Potter glasses. Um, uh, does anyone have any we could borrow? And then, like, I think maybe, like, an hour or so later, um, one of her friends contacted her and was like, yes, we have them. So I went there, we picked the glasses out, we came home, and uh, then we did it. And then uh, probably a month or so, maybe later, um, we, we didn't have any tapes or anything to do it was just a normal day, just chilling. Then suddenly my manager calls and it's like, oh yeah, um, you, you've got the job. And um, I, I have this thing whenever I get a job um, or like same with like finding out season two of Ginny and Georgia, I like kind of just go, and I like don't really react, but in my head, I'm like, oh my God, Jesus. <laughs> um uh but yeah uh that was how uh we uh did that tape and how it went for us that's awesome um i love that you waited a month and then you were just chilling and then what you made everybody (laughs) in the audience do uh, watching on youtube when you froze was was think that our stream was over all of a sudden (laughs) um all right okay joe 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 
No, Ray, how, what was your experience when you read this script and, and you took a look at this character? Uh, how, how did it come about for you? What were your thoughts when you read the script and, and how did your audition process go? Um, I, I hadn't seen a script. I, I, you know, just got my couple of sides, my couple of scenes and, you know, like, I don't know if how your agents send you guys uh, material, but they, they kind of always have this like character breakdown at the bottom of, of the email. Like, hey, this is the project, all the specs on the projects and then the character breakdown. And I looked at it and, and I thought like, ah, this, this seems to me like it's probably going to be a white guy. You know, when you're like, you're looking at something and you, you, you see the characters in your head, right? And I thought, ah, shoot, this is going to be a white guy. And uh, he's got a farm, he's got horses. They're never going to hire some wiry, lanky brown guy, which, but, but truly like, you know, my, my family are, were indentured laborers. It's not like we didn't grow up on farms and, and work with animals and uh, do hard labor. And it's not like I haven't been working in kitchens for uh, seven, seven or eight years, uh, bartending and cooking expo serving. It's not like the character was unfamiliar. I just, I didn't even believe myself like that this was, that I was a match for it. Um, even though in so many ways, I think I, I, think I was. Um, so, so yeah, so um, I just thought like, how, how was I gonna make it, you know, that, that something in the character description said something about granola Yoda. Um, <laughs> and I thought, okay, what am I gonna make? Uh, you know, I, I thought he would wear uh, plaid and stuff like that. And, I, I don't know. I just thought like, I've, I've been a big brother my whole life. Um, and I've, I've been uh, unrequited in, in love before. And I just thought I gotta, I gotta, I gotta dial up those parts of myself and bring that. And hopefully they, they like that. So I just, pl I played those parts. And luckily I, I Did really you think he would be a hockey fan, Ray. Oh, if it was me, Joe's you... a hockey fan. Of course. So is, is he a Maple Leafs fan? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's probably, if, I'm, if I'm honest, he's probably a Boston fan, which I hate. Uh, I hate that he's a Boston fan. Um, but yeah, he probably is. Uh, no, and then I, I just have to say, like, you know, I, I even even me looking at the sides, thinking that it would be a white guy. Um, I don't know if I ever thanked either of you, um, Sarah, Deb, for, you know, going a different way with it. And it's not like I'm not that character or that people that came from my line were not that character. Um, so thanks. Well, we are proud to have you. And uh, I know Sarah and Deb probably are itching to talk about casting you. But uh, I think something that the fans know is that the representation on the show is very important. It comes in all forms. And uh, speaking of representation of a, a lesser heard from, uh, you know, family out there, you know, the Baker family across the street, the, the father figure is deaf. They all speak at ASL, which is incredible. It's not something you see very often. Uh, the show takes chances and brings things to the fore that people don't think about every single day. So let's go to the matriarch of the Baker family. Yeah, Jen, been all surprised. And, uh, and yeah, I'm going to make chat wait. I know you all just want to hear Felix talk in that Australian voice, but uh, you're, he's going to talk last. So we're just going to do that today. <laughs> uh, let's start with Jen. How, how did it go for you? I was finishing Schitt's Creek and panicking that I would never work again. And uh, this lovely script came my way. And I always, I have a very hard time learning dialogue, but if it's great dialogue, I don't have a problem with it. If it's dialogue that fits me, it just, it just happens. And I remember just going into audition for it, going, this character, I, love her this is so fun and um and I went in and then I did a little FaceTime with Deb and Sarah and Anya and we talked a little bit about the show but I think we talked about just like life and I don't know what but we all kind of fell in love and that's how it happened and then I got to fall in love with this cast so and yeah that's awesome. And fall in love with your two on-screen kids. Uh, on -screen Sarah, how did, how did auditioning for Maxine go? Uh, probably the craziest dialogue in our show comes out of your mouth. So I want to know how that audition went. Yeah. Um, I don't like auditions. I'm not good at them. 
and they really freak me out. And so whenever I get an email that says I have an audition, my first response is, oh, like I, I literally, like my heart starts beating and get anxiety, whatever. But um, I don't look at the character description until I read the script. And so I read the script and it, I fell in love with it immediately. Um, Max has a really interesting voice that I've never ever seen before and it felt very authentic to me just in how I speak and in my humor and and um then I looked at the breakdown and I saw that it was a female team and I was like oh my god like I need this so bad and um I auditioned for it seven times um they brought me back in again and again and I did the same five six page scene from the cafeteria in episode one and I did that I think 46 times and it's entirety um wow. so that was really funny and the moment I got the role I was actually in bed crying because I thought I didn't get it <laughs> I was like sobbing um and then I looked over at my phone and and the casting director texted me and was like got it and I was like don't lie to me right now <laughs> and, um, and that was uh my experience and I I I'm still since then, every day I've been like, I don't think I actually have the words to explain how grateful I am and how proud I am that it's done this well. And I'm just very, very lucky to be part of it. So is that how you, I think that cafeteria scene, I, I think you posted like an IG live post or something of you lip syncing to the scene. You're like sitting behind a laptop and you're like that saying. <laughs> that was a TikTok, sir. Oh, um, sorry, I'm and old. It was <laughs> It was, um, that was the birthday scene, which is like another hilarious, cute scene. But the cafeteria scene was like the one where she's like showing Ginny around. And she's like, these are my friends. And she just doesn't shut up. That was the scene. So it was like a full monologue. Do you think you say it in your sleep sometimes? Just mumble it. You wake up just saying the words. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. All right, Felix. So how'd it go for you? Were you in LA? Were you in Australia? Where were you when you got That's this a, gig? And uh, what about Marcus uh, was attractive to you as an actor? That's a great question. I was in uh, Toronto. I was, I was filming season one of Lock and Key and um, the audition popped up and it was this really fun, edgy, bad boy kind of character, but he was really funny and he was very sweet at the same time. And I really kind of, um, I love that. And I, I love that he had so many masks built up and I um, was hoping that they could, you know, bring him down throughout the season. Um, and I was very fortunate that I'd actually worked with uh, Alyssa Weisberg, the casting director before she cast me in um, Happy Together a year before, two years before that. Um, so it came through and because we had kind of had that relationship with her, I did the tape and then uh, she like texted right back. She's like, hey, uh, let's do it another way. Let's just let's kind of tweak it a bit. And then we sent it off again. And then she said, well, nah, they want it kind of this way. And so I called my other, my friend to come back into the hotel room and do it the third time. Um, and then it was just by chance. I think you guys were up in Toronto, like scouting locations and I got to come in and um, do the, the whole audition thing in person, which was really great. Um, I feel like half of auditioning is just being in the room and seeing if you guys are going to get along and see if you can work together for, you know, six to seven months. Um, and I was just lucky enough that they, they chose me. You know, I, I couldn't see any other actor in any of these roles. Uh, and it's, you know, I've worked on shows before where you have an idea of what a character is going to be before you walk into that first table read, right? And then you are, are shocked a little bit of, of how an actor maybe doesn't fit what you thought you saw in your head, but the clarity in Sarah and, and Deb's uh, words and, and creations and characters uh, in that pilot, which was a little, it, it read with such an edge. There was so much bite to it uh, when I read it that I was just, I was surprised uh, like almost every single page as I turned it. And that surprise, uh, you know, just led to the rest of the season uh, just for the actors, especially like surprise after surprise after surprise. And for people who were watching it, they didn't know what was coming next. And season one was just a roller coaster for so many people. Just really quickly wanted to ask like, what was everybody's kind of favorite moment in season one? Uh, I'll start, it's a very small moment. 
It's a very small moment and it's Jen's moment. She walks into the house. Georgia says something to her. There's a piece of cake there. She turns to the left and she takes this big bite of cake and goes, oh, shit. <laughs> like, it's like you're taking a bite of cake. And it was just like a very little moment. Uh, but it was just like exactly how I felt watching almost every episode because I work in kind of uh, a very small pocket of the show. I don't work with almost any of the kids. I work with Brianne. I work with Tony. One scene with Tony, like basically, or like two scenes with Tony, like basically, and a couple of scenes with Diesel, but not, not a lot with anybody else. So watching the show, I felt like an audience member. And <laughs> Ellen's reaction in that moment was like my reaction to almost every episode. So uh, we'll start, I guess we'll start at the top. Sarah, did you have a favorite moment to, uh, to watch on screen or, or to shoot? And then we'll just work our way down. Uh, honestly, for me, I, on, I, this, I feel like whenever I'm looking at the screen, like I'm looking at all of you guys and I'm filled with genuinely like so much joy to see you again. And then I like catch a glimpse of my like sunburned tomato face, just like beaming like a doofus. I mean, honestly, like, I feel like that was my experience the whole show. It's like, you write a pilot, like I was alone in my apartment. Like it, it's, and then it's no longer, it's no longer me and Deb's show. Like once the actors get it and you guys really like took these characters and just like, I don't even, I mean, it's, it, I feel like that's the most surreal thing is as a writer, it's just the words and you kind of see it in your head. And then like you guys came in and you bre breathed complete life into it. I would beam like a moron in Video Village, just watching you guys do these things. And it was just like, I had such implicit trust in all of you. I knew you were going to do it right. Like I just never worried about that. So I don't have one moment. I really don't have one moment. Now I'm going to cry. Goodbye. Talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, it's, it's a good point that Sarah's making though. It's like, it's, it's maybe for us and the creation of the show, it's not necessarily uh, watching the show and having a favorite scene. It, it's, it's also being on set or even offset, like a favorite moment that you had uh, during season one. Deb, did you have a moment? It is, you're asking me to choose like, between all my children, because I have like 500,000 moments that I love. Like, I mean, in every episode, like Sarah used to try to pin me down, like, which episode is your favorite? And I'd be like, no, I refuse. I can't because there's so much. I've seen the show, Sarah and I have seen the show no less than 5,000 times through editing and the post process. And I still, to this day, laugh at different moments for all of you. Like I could pick five moments through all of you are in that I still laugh and cry. Um, but I will say, I think now I can admit, I, I, the pilot and episode 10 are very high up there as the bookends of the show for me, where it started and where we ended. So, I'll pick episodes. I can't pick because literally I have so many moments, so many. And maybe okay. I'll pull hey. on like Insta story. After. I'll let you, I'll let you cop out, but you can text okay. me. Thank uh, you. Actually, actually, I think like our favorite moment is eating an oversized, uh, oversized slice of pizza after a night of karaoke. I think that's, I mean, like <laughs> that's a personal moment for you and I like eating pizza the size of our face after karaoke. Yes. <laughs> and I have uh, a very big face. So it's like the whole screen. So yes. <laughs> Brianne, what was your, if you can, if it's possible, can you pick a favorite? This one? is very hard. This is very difficult. I, I gave you guys these questions two I days know. ago. <laughs> I know. Look, a sequence that I could watch for the rest of my life is Mang coming down as Britney Spears. I, I could watch that forever on replay. Yes. I think watching Georgia and Ellen smoke weed brings me so much joy. Also in part, because I think that was the first day we really shot together, Jen, I think. Yeah. And I just was so nervous and giddy and excited to get to be in a scene with Jen. So like all of my personal dreams were coming true and all of the tender Ginny and Georgia moments because there's not a ton of them really I cherish and and they they bring me so much joy. It's it with everybody, there's, it's more, it's so hard, but also it's kind of what you were saying, Scott, that watching the show back is overwhelming because you're kind of watching it as an audience member for the scenes that 
you weren't in. And then the scenes that you are in, shooting it, it's coming back to you. You remember what you were doing on that day and you remember what went wrong and what went right. And it's a whole experience. So you kind of have to watch it a bunch, but it's the best. Yeah. Okay, Tony. What, Hi. what do you think? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think, uh, wow, listen here. Uh, you know, there are a lot of great moments. Um, I really like some actually like behind the scene moments. Uh, I remember when Diesel <laughs> uh, ate too many Oreos in the mayor's office and we all know what happened after that. Um, <laughs> um, and I remember when um, Sarah and it was in episode five when we had to bring Maxine back into her house and I was like you're so drunk like and she ad-libbed and it was just like the whole moment between her and Marcus was just so funny um the dinner scene in episode when oh god is it episode eight when Zion and Paul and De or uh, Austin and um Georgia and, and Ginny are all at the dinner table and um kind of Brienne had me cracking up so much. I, I almost choked on uh, the tofu I was eating. It was just such a funny, funny moment. There's so many moments in the show um, that I could just go on and on about, but I really, for the most part, had so much fun working with this incredible cast and just really enjoying everyone's personalities and having such amazing memories that we made, um, not only while filming, but off, you know, off set and behind the scenes and in the green room and like, a Felix, Sarah and I running to the food truck to get grilled cheese and it was snowing and I was just so excited to be in snow and we were all just acting like giddy children making snow angels. It was just dumb, so dumb, dumb happiness. Um, so I had so many great moments um, working with everyone and just like Sarah and Deb and just, oh my God. So I could go on forever, but I won't because we shouldn't. But yeah, those are some of my favorites a little bit. <laughs> uh, let's see, let's... Uh... Let's go. Uh, Diesel, do you want to tell us what happened when you ate too many Oreos or do we want to move on to a different favorite moment? <laughs> okay, um, but before I get to the actual question, it was a moment, it was indigestion. And I just kind of like hicked up, um, hiccuped it up in like a tissue and then threw it away. It was not a vomit. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, thank <to> you. <laughs> My, my favorite moment um uh is uh it was um we were um sitting in the inside set of uh joe's bloom farm cafe and um we were just waiting there talking and then me and sarah start talking about um frozen 2 and then we just start making up these really stupid and dumb dance moves for into the unknown and yeah, the, the, I, I don't even know how to explain it. It was just so funny at the time. I, I think I even have a video of it. Um, but yeah, that's my favorite moment of filming. Will you share that video with some of us so that we can see? That would be amazing. And also, uh, Diesel, uh, another favorite moment of mine is kicking the soccer ball around with you on the front lawn. That, that was, I had so much fun with you that day. It was incredible. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Sarah. Um, I have to say hey. that, that moment was hilarious. I watched that video on my phone more times than I care to admit because Diesel's laugh in it, like it could fuel a spaceship. Like it is so, I love his laugh. Um, yeah, there are too many moments really. I, I this was the, the dream role for me and, and, and these people have all monumentally changed my life in so many different ways. Um, I do have to say that I have a special place in my heart for that scene where Tony's bringing me in drunk or Ginny, whatever, I, it's all so blurred. Um, <laughs> but that's because I'm, I'm terrified of improv and both Tony and Felix were like, just do it. Like you're gonna be, and like, so they're so supportive as scene partners and they, everybody just really contributed to an amazing work environment that made me feel so safe to try things. And, and I just, I laughed so hard that day. I laughed hard every day. That's like, what's so great about this whole show is like every day was an absolute dream. So I cannot pick a singular moment. All right, let's go to somebody that can pick a moment. Um, that's not, I'm not gonna go to Ray cause I feel like Ray's got too many. Uh, uh, all right, hold on, Jen. Jen, can you pick a moment? 
One sing, moment. Sing. So, sing, sing. Sing, sing. Love, yes. Sing, sing. There's not like I love being on a TV show, but I also love musicals. So there's nothing better than a musical happening within a TV show. Yes. Yes. Uh, Felix, favorite moment? I have three. I have three. Oh, I mean, they're all amazing. I think that's what we're all saying. Hang on, let me get this. There we go. Um, I have three. There was uh, a, an amazing moment that unfortunately got cut when we were shooting it. But um, when Maxine and um, and Jen were arguing, and and like they would, she wasn't allowed to go to uh, the the sleepover. Jen did this amazing angry waffle turn in like response to like, you're the worst. Uh, Jen was like, yeah, with, with the waffle maker. And it was um, hilarious. I really, I'm glad I wasn't in the shot because I was laughing the whole time. It was stellar. That So funny. Uh, so that was amazing. Um, the scene between um, Marcus and Jenny in the locker room was one of my favorites as well, because that's kind of the moment that they're, it's the first time that they're honest with each other, which I think is just kind of a real turning point. They're both kind of sussing each other out up until that point. And then when, when that scene comes, you kind of, they both bear their souls a little bit and you, you get to see what could happen between them later on down the line. Um, and then the third was um, Maxine and Marcus's fight. Uh, at, I think episode, is it 10? Yeah, it's 10. Um, because that was amazing. Like the, when you guys posted the rehearsal, even I love that because there was so, we did so many different versions of, of the final kind of like going at each other that uh, it was just that we had a blast shooting and Jen's reaction at the end, we did, you know, it was hilarious. I, I, that, those three moments, I mean, they were all amazing, but those three were, were highlights for sure. That's awesome. Uh, Wait, can I point out a line that Ray, has, as Joe said about Sing Sing, just like my one of my favorite lines in the show, yes, where he points please. to the poster. <laughs> he pointed to the poster and went, "Sing Sing, a musical about all white people behind bars, a work of fiction." It was just, <laughs> I'm sorry, it was just really funny. I don't do it as well as Ray, but um, I don't think was that written or was did yeah, you ad-libbed. say and make that up? He yeah, was, you ad libbed it, right? Right. That's what was so funny about it. It's like. Ray just ad libbed this stellar, hilarious comedic moment. And I was like, I freaking cried laughing. So anyway, yeah, great. They're all great moments. Okay, I'm going to mute myself. That's awesome. I, I was I was joking earlier, Ray. I know you're more than uh, more than able to uh, to pick a favorite moment. I'm just kind of playing with people in chat. Uh, there are a lot of people in chat right now, by the way, guys. And I want to say hi to everybody at, in chat. Uh, but uh, they were they were begging for some Joe. So I I. I've made I made the people wait a little bit, and now, give us your answer. Uh, I can't believe no one said Avril Vagine. Oh yes, oh, that's that was, a good one. Uh, too, yeah, that was astounding. <laughs> uh, Avril Vagine was great. Um, on my last day of shooting, uh, I think it was the stuff where uh, where Jen, you come and and uh, ask to see the ring, um, to see Brienne's ring. And, and then I'm, I'm like, oh no, I feel, I feel terrible. Um, that moment coming, like, you know, we finished that scene there, we're moving on to the next one. So the crew's all bustling into the space. And, uh, and I was talking to Janine just cause I was still like riled up from, from it, not knowing how it looks or feels. And, uh, and she was, she just told me it, it went well there and that, that was like the moment where I was like, okay, maybe I can, maybe I can do this scene. Maybe we can do, maybe I can do this show. And it's episode 10 and it's like basically my last scene. And I was finally feeling like, all right, I think I, I, think I belong here. Um, <laughs> that was like a nice little moment for me, but Avril Vagine mostly, I think. And uh, Confessions in the Stairwell with Sarah. I was just going to say, Ray, do you remember what you said to me in Confessions in a Stairwell, which I have yet to post and I need to, but. No, what? You turn to me and in all earnestness, you go, you know, I think I'm really starting to understand Joe. And it was the last day of filming. And I was like, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, oh. you fully understood Joe the whole way and you were incredible. But it's just, it was just very, it was funny. You're funny. Oh, that is very much Ray. He is one of the 
Humble most us. thoughtful souls I've ever met in my life. And uh, one of my other favorite moments of the first season was going with him to a Maple Leafs game, puck drop, wow. opening weekend. We went and saw Leafs Canadians. And even though the Leafs lost, uh, uh, it was just such a fun night. And then we stayed up until like four o'clock in the morning in a, in a hotel and like a, in a bar lobby. <laughs> So yeah. house just Don't forget uh, uh, other people yeah. were there, but uh, it was yeah. kind of like Joe and I was kind of like uh, Joe and Paul only had eyes for each other that night as they were just just meeting at a at a very soulful level. It was a wonderful evening though. We got we got to see Deb and Sarah and Jeff, uh, one of our producers uh, that night as well. So it was that was a wonderful night. Okay, speaking of wonderful nights, this. Uh, is a wonderful night. It's the first time a lot of us have gotten back together. And, uh, and, and a big part of this night is just for the fans to say thank you so much. Um, but we are here for a cause. And uh, I wanted to let everybody know that we did have some technical difficulties. We're pushing this just a little bit longer to make sure that everybody gets, uh, everybody gets like a full amount of time for the reunion portion. But afterwards, we're going to be doing an awesome fan Q&A. And we are trying to raise money for the HDSA, the Huntington's Disease Society of America, to help them in their fight against Huntington's disease and to help support those that are living with it. Um, and some of the funds from uh, the money that they raise uh, as an organization, go to building out centers for excellence. If you can imagine having a disease that no doctor understands, if you can imagine having a disease living in the city of Chicago and having to go all the way to Houston before you can find a doctor that can help you, uh, that was a real that was a reality for some people uh, just a decade ago. And uh, the Huntington's Disease Society of America uh, set up centers of excellence all across this country uh, in the United States so that people who uh, find out that they have a diagnosis of Huntington's disease, have something close by where they can go to speak to doctors that, that know about HD, that can help them get the right therapies to, to uh, make their life a lot easier and, and let them know they're not alone in the battle against HD. So uh, if anybody out there is, is so inclined to donate, you can go to hdsa.org slash Ginny and Georgia, and you can donate there. And anybody who donates $20 or more uh, will get an invitation immediately to join us for our fan exclusive question and answer session uh, after we finish with the reunion. Um, okay. I'm having a great time. I hope you guys are as well, especially out there in chat and and our and the fellow panelists. I, I I feel like we're all smiling. I feel like all of our cheeks are hurting from like just constantly smiling, listening to each other's answers because we haven't been able to do this. The year of 2020, we didn't get to see each other at all. And instead, waited and waited and waited for our show to come out. And when it finally did, uh, we all consumed it, binged it, just like everybody else out there. I was wondering in, in the year of 2020, what was everybody up to? Uh, and, and did you binge anything? Or was there like a, a like a certain musical act that you just listened to all the time to get you through or a show that you watched that you never stopped watching? Uh, so what were you up to? And, and what was your binge uh, of 2020? Uh, let's start with Tony this time. Um, I watched Queen's Gambit. Um, and Survivor, Ooh, and I yes, planted Survivor. a lot of plants. Yes, um, yes, that's that's what I did. <laughs> I think it's important to tell everybody out there how much of our cast and uh, and our creative side of of this show. Uh, I'm a big Survivor fan, but a lot of people just found Survivor for the first time last year, and I am ecstatic because it means when we go back to shoot season two, which we we got season two uh, and we're going to be going back big, big, big. I'm so happy. I can't wait. I don't know when we're going back, but we're going back. And when we do, we can get together and do like little survivor watch parties. It's going to be insane. So that, that will be awesome. Okay. Uh, let's see. Ray, anything you binged uh, and what did you do in 2020? Oh man. Uh, like so many shows. I just finished Bojack Horseman, which was so good. Uh, at, the beginning of it, though, at the beginning of 2020, uh, we watched Kid Nation. I don't know if anyone has seen that show. Ooh. It was like a reality show, like a survivor, but for children and completely ill-advised. They should not have made this show. It was beautiful. And, and oh, it's, it's, it's torture. You've got, I think it's on YouTube even. You can just go watch it. So Kid Nation was great. Um, Chernobyl. So, like, I, I don't know. TV's always on. Yeah. The office for the got to be about <laughs> five hundred time. Uh, Jen, what uh, what did you watch over twenty twenty, and what did you get up to? 
I watched everything. I also listened to every single podcast ever made, I think. I feel like I Brene browned, I got vulnerable, I smart list and laughed my ass off. Smart list, such a funny podcast. Um, I read a few books and I homeschooled my child, but mostly I needed the new age podcasts to get through the homeschooling stuff. Yeah, we all needed a little bit of help, I think, at, at some point math or another. Math not hard. <laughs> math not hard. And she's a great five. It's not yeah. looking good for me. <laughs> You're going to make it through. We will be there for you. Uh, my, I got, I got lucky. My, my son uh, is not starting kindergarten until this year. So I don't even have uh, one of them in kindergarten yet. The other one's in preschool. So, uh, I, I didn't have to do the, the home education, uh, as of yet, but, uh, Felix, I know you've been working a lot, but, uh, have you been watching anything and what were you up to in 2020? I've been watching so much, so <laughs> much. Um, I, I, look, I'm not going to name everything cause we'll be here for hours. Um, but I, I think a big binge was the Mindy Project. I think we watched all like six seasons in, in, in a week. Uh, I watched, um, I had a whole list and now they're all gone. Um, uh, Bojack again, um, The Office again, The Lady in the Dale was amazing. Alone, do you guys know Alone? It's like Survivor, but it, like they get like survival specialists and they just drop them in the middle of Alaska and just they have, they can bring like six things and they can choose what it is. And every single one of them goes, I'm going to be the one that survives alone. And then they like fall and trip on a rock on the first day. It's great. It's amazing. There's six seasons. Just and they down. don't know, they don't know when somebody else is eliminated. So they're just no. literally out there alone. They're and alone. They don't know. It, they could be two months past the other person that dropped out and they don't yeah. get, it's not until they tap out that the, the yeah. show is over. And uh, they, they, they bring you out if you lose too much weight, like if it's unhealthy for you and there are people who like want to stay and it's really, it's, it's kind of like the, the kid nation. It's, it, it shouldn't be a thing, but it, I mean, it is. And <laughs> I've been consuming it a lot. Um, Diesel. Oh, sorry, Felix. Okay. I didn't have anything as, by the way, it's fine. <laughs> Diesel. Um, I watched a lot of things when um, I came back from Ginny and Georgia because there was like so much things I already hadn't watched. So, well, I mean, when I came back, I had finished watching watching The Vampire Diaries because I'd watched that um, while filming Ginny and Georgia. Then I started to watch Child on the fan, and then there was an episode I saw, and then I was like, Oh my god, that's Scott. That, that's Scott. And I saw Scott in it, and then Mum uh, called him and was like, "Okay, um, these are just so this show." And, but I, I, I like freaked out, and I was like, "Oh my god, Mum, it's it's cool, it's cool." Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I watched um all ten seasons of Friends in like a week. Um, I, I, I was like obsessed with it. Um, yeah. Um, and. Oh, what else did I watch? Um, well, I'm in the middle of watching because uh, like episodes are coming out every week of um, a show called Legacies. Um, and also, um, what am I also watching now? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I forgot. Someone um, put Diesel on the CW, please. Yes. I know. Yeah. He watches <laughs> all the CW shows. Hey, you watch things that are scarier than I'll watch, too. That's... Uh... <laughs> And I'd love, you know what, my my wife would, uh, my wife is going to flip when I tell her that you binged all 10 seasons of Friends. Uh, yeah. That is her favorite show. We have to fall asleep to that every single night. She has to have it on in the background. She cannot fall asleep without Friends. Oh, Sarah's saying me too. Um, okay, who hasn't? Deb, Brianne, Sarah, and Sarah, right? That's who we still need. Uh, let's start with uh, Deb. What have you been up to? 2020, what have you been watching? What have you been uh, doing? Well, just... For the fans, we Sarah and I were editing and post production the show till September of uh, 2020, and then this is not a kiss ass for Netflix, but I binged after that The Queen's Gambit, all of The Crown because I had never seen it, Bridgerton, and Emily in Paris. Like those were my like boom 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 as soon as we like wrapped the show, and then our Friday night. Uh, there's like a Friday night, like friends, sometime actors come in and join. We have like a, a mafia slash werewolf type game over Zoom, which was great during the pandemic. 
who has played in the Zoom Mafia werewolf thing? Let's see. The rest of y'all got to get on it. Come on. I've been too busy growing in my room over 2020. It's fine. (laughs) Everyone. I don't trust any of you. (laughs) Mafia. I hold a grudge. Brianne, you were just on Bravo next week, so I'm assuming. I mean, last week, I'm I'm assuming you're on Watch What Happens Live, which I freaked out about because because uh, you and I watch a show every every Monday below deck. That's but thing. what <laughs> that's our thing. What else? Uh, what else have you been watching? What have you been up to since we wrapped the show? I did um, Queen's Gambit, WandaVision, Bridgerton, The Great. Right when COVID hit, was yes. amazing. So the good. Great. Um, we redid Breaking Bad and Friday Night Lights. Nice. And it just, it's like the best feel good show. It is one of my favorites. And I don't know why it's so fun. What, I don't know if I'm sure you guys feel this way, watching people you've worked with, watching their other projects. I don't know. It's so fun and fulfilling. And um, we ate up every second of it. I had already seen it, but Matt hadn't. So we redid that and I got a dog, redid the backyard you know, things of this sort, really. <laughs> well, that's yeah, a, when you're... I had a big um, paint by numbers phase in the beginning of COVID. <laughs> I did way I too love it. and people were forced to receive them as gifts. Yes. How many, how many friends idea. have you forced to hang on the wall? Like, do you walk, if like you go to like their house now, or are you grandma. like, where's the art? Yeah, it's like people's grandmas, I gave it to them. Um, <laughs> just felt like, you know, they might like it, really. <laughs> I feel like they would like that, though. <laughs> I'm, it, I'm waiting, I'm anxiously waiting for mine uh, to come. Oh, I, I have a spot for it. For? Uh, okay. <laughs> the Are Sarahs, you? both of you, what, what have you been watching? What have you been up to? I'll let you decide who goes first. Go, my beauty. <laughs> okay, I'll go. Um, All I do is watch TV. It's literally my only hobby. So uh, literally every show on Discovery, Bravo, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon. I mean, Survivor, obviously. Friends to fall asleep because that helps with my anxiety. The Office, Parks and Rec, Schitt's Creek. Um, Definitely also Degrassi. Um, I've watched literally every single Naked and Afraid, Naked and Afraid XL. (laughs) Uh, literally all I do. Oh my God. I watched the great on Hulu. I watched, uh, normal people. That was a mistake for me to watch during the pandemic. Cause it was so good, but like too good. Like I felt it that I wrote like an email to my ex-boyfriend. I got too involved in normal people. Um, I, I, I just watch every show. I should be done. I'm done. Sarah, your turn. <laughs> oh my God. Um, miss you a lot. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, well, the coolest thing about my 2020 was I graduated from university. Yeah, Um, that was pretty cool. I was actually shooting the show during my first semester. So that was wild. Um, But I finished it and I actually had to do like the whole zoom lecture thing, which was really, really funny. um, Because it was just so awkward. Um, But yeah, so I I did that. And I started writing a show that I really, really like and I'm passionate about, which is super fun. Also got a dog and watched at least 28 seasons of Survivor. I got on the Survivor trend too, and it's been so fun. My family actually threw me a Survivor-themed birthday, um, and they voted me out. (laughs) Um, But I idled their asses, so uh, we're all good. (laughs) (laughs) You got the the whole experience. You did the entire thing. Uh, I can't (laughs) wait to talk with all of you about Survivor. I am a huge, uh, huge old Survivor fan. It's the greatest game show of all time. I don't call it a reality show. It is a game show. There's a million dollar prize. So what's your title? uh, You're like the biggest fan. What is your title? You have a title. I don't, I don't have a title. I do have an idol that I was given by Jeff Probst because I went to Fiji uh, to do all of the cast interviews for Game Changers, the season of Game Changers. At the time I was on a CBS show called Scorpion and they wanted to do a crossover between their scripted and their reality side. And they knew I was a big fan. So they flew me down. I got to interview Jeff Probst and uh, he sent, he gave me an idol, but he said, this idol doesn't, uh, this idol doesn't get you out of something. It gets you into something. So come back, give me the idol and you can be on survivor whenever you want. And I, uh, have thought about taking him up on it many, many times, but, uh, I got to take him up on it. I got to sleep on a, on a, on a beach one night. I got to go to the first tribal council of that season. 
uh, I, I got to go sit by the water well and listen to some of these secret conversations that happen. And uh, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty cool. I was at the marooning and uh, yeah, it was, it was a dream come true. Um, speaking about dream come true, uh, being a part of the show has been a dream come true for all of us. And Netflix takes their time to renew something. And I know that we all were, you know, texting each other a little bit. We all had positive thoughts, thought we were coming back, you know, we're hoping, but you know, as the clock starts to tick down, you start to get a little bit worried, but, but season two happened. And I, I know that I speak for all of us when I say that we are so thrilled to continue these character stories, uh, not only for the fans out there that are watching right now and, and hanging out with us on this wonderful evening for a great cause, but uh, for ourselves as well, I, I think we've all fallen in love with our characters. We can't wait to learn more about them and, and see what's next. So I want to take a moment before we sign off um, to to just say, uh, let everybody say something to the fans, say thank you, and 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 also uh, where you were and how excited you were uh, when you found out about season two. Let's start uh, with Ray. Um. <laughs> uh. I was I was here in this same apartment when uh, when I got the news and what ha I okay so okay you guys go to sleep listening to to friends in the office and everything same and so often my phone will die so I had it on airplane mode I missed the phone call from Deb uh, and I I don't know for whatever reason I turned my phone back on and I, I saw like a, a text message and then I tried calling her back, but it was way too late, whatever, whatever. So then we, we did a phone call in the morning the next day, but I kind of like, I, I, the message was something like, Raymond, call me back. We need to talk to you. Uh, something like that. And I was like, oh Jesus. Uh, like I thought uh, just a whole bunch of different thoughts of what might be happening. Listen, we got season two, but they, they don't want you back. Yeah, like I, it just seemed like I was being called into the principal's office or something. And I was, so, um, yeah, so I had a whole restless night that night and then uh, first thing in the morning and then we woke up Sarah. Um, we woke Sarah up. So it was like a conference call with the three of us and Sarah was like still in bed. I hope I'm not embarrassing you. Yeah, still in bed. I was, I, you guys called me and I was like, yeah, we have a season two, goodbye. Like, <laughs> <laughs> But Ray yeah. genuinely was like scared. I was like, hello, do you think we would go through all of this? Like. <laughs> It just read so video, fairness, like waking Sarah up. Hello. In all fairness, it is scary. You get a, you get a text at like two a.m. Call me. <laughs> yeah. Was was that kind I of the same canceled. for all of What's us? Because it, it happened to me over it happened to me over my kids' spring break. I was at a cabin in Colorado, and it was the same thing. It was like we need to talk. Did that happen mm. for all of us? Mm. I taken like no. five. <laughs> I had like five melatonin. And I like I got this call. I was like, right, right, right. "Hi, what's what's up? Are we okay?" And I actually ignored the first call because I was like, "It's fine. They'll call in the morning." And they're like, "No, call me." I was like, oh, "Here we go. Oh. We're canceled. All yeah, right. So <laughs> this is a thank you for all your support." And then no, it was, it was amazing. And then I went back. To Wait, who said not me? Was that Tony? Tony, what did you know something special? I was um I was I was at home on my bed talking to my cat. Um, losing my mind a little, it's fine. And I was like, oh, look, the Roomba. I was watching my Roomba um, clean my bedroom. Deb goes, hey, are you busy? I said, no, sent her a picture of my Roomba. <laughs> I was like, just watching my Roomba. She was like, okay, I'm gonna call you. And then Deb, Sarah and Brienne, all we were all calling and I was like in bed like this, like, hey. And um, that's when we all found out, or at least it's when I found out uh, that we got renewed for season two. And I think I like screamed and threw my phone and then I was like, oh wait, I should probably put the phone up. And uh, so that's how it happened for me. No, uh, I, no 2 a.m. phone call. No Just pics of the Roomba. Roomba. <laughs> no pics of yeah. the Roomba didn't happen. That's, that's, that's what they say. Right. No. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly okay. what they say. That is a saying. <laughs> well, we have about three minutes left uh, before we sign off and we head to the Q and A. Um, uh, I want everybody real quick to to say anything they want to the fans, whether that be thank you or or whatever you would like to say uh, before we sign off. Uh, and just this could be a free for all. Whoever wants to talk, talk. Let's do it. Thank you thank so you. much. Woo! Thank you, 
thank you to especially those 52 million of you that watched all 10 episodes in the first 28 days and let us beat Tiger King. We will forever have bragging rights for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want, I yeah. want to say a thank you to all the fans, but I also want to say a thank you to everyone on this call. Um, I could not love all of you more. You've made my dreams come true. I can't believe you are my coworkers. Deb, my fearless leader and my love. Thank you. And thank you to all the fans as well. Yeah. Sarah and Deb, we quite literally wouldn't be here without you guys. So thank you so much. You've changed the trajectory of everything. Scott, thank you for having us here today. I've missed everyone's faces so much. This is making me so happy. And to everyone who's been supporting us, we quite literally wouldn't have a season two without you guys. So it's all you. Thank you so much. I, I just want yeah. to say thank you, um, Sarah and Deb for choosing me for Austin. Um, uh, I just feel like really lucky to like, yeah. I'm, I'm literally- Oh my God. We feel really lucky to have you with us. I mean, it's, uh, you're an incredible kid. This whole cast, I, I think, you know, uh, <laughs> Avril, uh, what was, what was the name, Ray? Avril. What was Avril, Avril Vagine. I mean, Dan Birney, I mean, all, every single actor that was cast on this show, uh, everyone who can't be here with us tonight, um, you know, it, it's just, everybody was cast so perfectly. I've never seen a cast come together quite in the way that this one did. And I know I said it earlier, but I just feel so fortunate to be a part of a show where everybody up top trusts all of us to inhabit these characters. They give us amazing things to work with and they allow us to bring these characters to life and, and, and the right actors are in the right roles. It's just been an incredible journey. And I'm sure I speak for, for all of us when I say we cannot get back to work. And we cannot wait to get back to work and to share season two with everyone out there. So with that, I want to say thank you to the fans. I want to say thank you to everyone here uh, on the panel. Thank you for giving your time. Um, the motto of the HDSA is family is everything. Um, Huntington's disease is a quintessential family disease. Uh, it's genetic in nature. And like I said earlier, every child of a parent with Huntington's has a 50-50 shot of inheriting it. And when you find yourself in the midst of a struggle against something like this, you have to reach out to more than just your nuclear family. You have to reach out to people that you feel close to out in the world to help you support. And I feel like the gang of Jenny and Georgia is a family. Uh, we went through it not, not knowing how massive this show would be, but we all believed in it. That belief was infectious. It came from Sarah, it came from Deb. Uh, Brianne and Tony were every single day uh, just leading us through and, and carrying uh, so much on their shoulders as we went through that tough, tough season to shoot. You know, uh, a lot of people were away from their homes and we're, we're all the way across continents uh, or, you know, countries and, and, and we're just forging something special uh, out of, out of an idea. And I couldn't think of a better group to do it with. And I couldn't think of a better group to ask to be here with me tonight to try and raise money for this incredible cause. You all are my family. I thank you so much for being here. And like Deb said to all the 52, 54, 60 million people at this point that have watched the show, your family too. And we say, thank you so much. And we can't wait to see you in season two. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.